Psalm 73, reading verses 25 to 28. So Psalm chapter 73, starting at verse number 25. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Father, we thank you again for the day that you've given us. Father, thank you for the evening that we can have together. Thank you for the songs that we've sung. Thank you, Father, for the word that we've just read. I pray that you would minister to our hearts tonight, guiding us according to your will. Lord, as always, we spiritually sit at the feet of Jesus, wanting to learn, wanting to hear from you, wanting to be guided by your spirit. We ask, Father, that you would do that as we draw nigh unto you, that you draw nigh unto us. Father, guide us and help us, Lord, according to your will, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I love verse number 25 as the psalmist says, it is good for me to draw near to God. It truly is because, you know, the closer we draw nigh unto the Lord, the more we see our need of God. The closer we draw to God, the more we see just the fallacies in our own life and in our own walk with the Lord because to draw closer to God is to draw closer into his brightness and into his glory. And the more closer we get to him, the brighter the light gets, the more that we see that uh, we need to work on in our own life. It's never to discourage us. Sometimes, you know, when if someone is told over and over and again, everything they're doing wrong, every time they do something wrong, it's just pointed out, it does get discouraging. But as a child of God, getting closer to God being made more into the image of Christ, we have a desire to want to get closer to God and for God to continue working in our life and helping us to be more like our Savior that we have been predestined to be. So to draw nigh unto the Lord truly is a good thing. It's never a bad thing. It helps us to be encouraged. It helps us to remind us of the victories that we have in Christ. And there's a few things tonight I want us to think about as we think about the truth and the blessing of drawing near to God is that when we do draw near to God, we're reminded that He is our source of forgiveness. He's our source of forgiveness as we draw near to Him. Look at Luke chapter 7. Keep a finger in Psalm 73, but look at Luke chapter 7. Just a lot of different things happen in our life personally as we draw close to the Lord because to be reminded of the forgiveness that we have with God truly does bring comfort into our hearts. It reminds us of His grace in our life and it helps us to stay close to Him. In Luke 7, you look at verse 37 and 38. The Bible says, Behold, a woman in, that, in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with ointment. Now those that were in the room at the time were not very happy with this woman, There were those that said that if he truly was a prophet, he would know what manner of woman this was that touched him. And Jesus did know, but this woman knew the forgiveness that she had with Christ, and it moved her to do what she did. She was moved within her spirit and heart to come and to sacrifice this ointment on the feet and on the head of her Lord and Savior. When you look down at verse 47, Jesus responds by saying, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. When we draw near unto the Lord like this woman did, we're reminded of the source of forgiveness 
that we have with our Lord and Savior. It's never good to distance ourselves from God because of sin or because of failure. Uh, Peter did that. Others did that. There are those I've even talked to that say they feel like they can't draw nigh unto God because of something they did. But that's exactly when we need to draw closer to God so that we have the healing of forgiveness so that we will be cleansed of our sin and that we will be filled with the grace and goodness of God. Look at Psalm 103. Psalm 103. The Christian life truly is a wonderful life because it's a life that we're ever learning. We're always learning. And we will continue to learn until we see the Lord and Savior face to face. And I think even after that, we will continue to learn. In Psalm 103 and verse 12, the Bible says, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. What a wonderful truth, again, that is that we're reminded of the source of forgiveness that we have with God. And it truly does encourage us and it helps us to continue living the Christian life that is difficult at times, but God has not left us alone. He's not deserted us, but he is here to help us along life's journey. And as the psalmist said, it is good for me to draw near to God. I want you to look at Psalm 147. We're not going to be long tonight, but when you look at Psalm 147, we're reminded as we draw close to the Lord, not only is he the source of our forgiveness, which comforts us and encourages us, but he's the source of our healing. There's times where we need healing in our life. Sometimes it's because of our own self-affliction. Sometimes it's the affliction of others. Sometimes it's the affliction of just things in life. But again, as we draw close to the Lord, we're reminded that he is the source of our healing. You know, before I even read this verse, as I think about just all the different accounts in the Gospels that we read as Jesus deals with people and he ministers to people, I'm looking forward to the day to looking into the face of Jesus and looking into those same eyes that all these people in Scripture we read about looked into his eyes. Can you imagine the unnamed woman that was brought to the temple because she was caught in the very act of adultery by the Pharisees and cast at Jesus' feet and they were condemning her and said, okay, the law says this, Moses says that she must die for her sin. What do you say? And I can just, I can just see that when Jesus looked up the second time and said, where are thine accusers? Because they were all convicted in their hearts and they'd left. And she said, they're not here. I can just see her looking into the face of Jesus and hearing him say, I condemn thee neither. Go thy way and sin no more. Just seeing the grace and love in his eyes. Because you know what? Though she was cast at his feet, she drew near to him. Yeah, she had accusers, but she had also heard about Jesus. And to hear him say, go and sin no more. To hear the grace and love and to look into the eyes of the very one who does have the authority and the power to forgive sins. In Psalm 147 and verse 3, He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. Turn to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26. This evening, I just want to remind us of the goodness of our Lord and remind us of just the comfort we find in fellowship with Him and in His presence. There are times where I believe some of God's people miss out miss out on spending time with the Lord and getting what they need. God knows exactly what we need. Sometimes we don't even know what we need, though we know we're missing something. You know, we're having, you know, the wrong feelings, the wrong emotions. And yet when we draw near to the Lord, we find exactly what we need in that moment. 
we find the forgiveness, the healing that we need, and we find our hearts being touched by the Lord. Ezekiel 36, look down at verse 26. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. You know what it's like to, to, be, to have a heart that's hardened, a heart that doesn't care, a heart that because of life circumstances, you become numb in certain ways and you become hard to, the, hard to life and maybe hard to people at different times. And yet, as we draw closer to the Lord, as we yield ourselves to God and we allow the Word of God to do its work in our life, we find time and time again, over and over, that our heart is like that fallow ground that's broken up. Our heart that is finds sensitivity in the presence of God. A heart that is able to love, a heart that's able to feel again because we're drawing closer to the one who has the source of all healing. The one that truly does breathe life into our life and breathes uh, just grace and love and helps us to understand that it truly is good to draw nigh unto the Lord. Not just on certain days, not just when we feel like it, but at all times. I want you to look with me at Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, and look, if you would, at verse 29. Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. We kind of touched on that verse this morning in the morning service of finding rest in our souls when we draw nigh unto the Lord and we, we come to him. But I want you to think about this tonight as we look at that verse is the fact that we do draw nigh unto the Lord. We find out that he is the one from whom we learn. We learn how to walk with the Lord. We learn how to handle things in life. We learn how to truly depend upon the Lord and how to truly cast our cares upon him. And we learn that he truly does know everything about us. Not everybody knows everything about you. Not everybody knows everything about me. Not, not everyone can tell me exactly what I need to hear to cheer me up. Though we try our best to do that, yet the Lord knows exactly how to answer every question we have, how to lead us in every way that we are walking in, that he has guided us and directed us in. Look at Psalm 34. Again, never stop learning. Always have a desire to learn as a Christian, as a child of God. Because as we continue to have that desire to learn and we allow ourselves to learn as we draw nigh to the Lord, it never gets old. Truly, the Christian walk never gets old. If it does, it's because we've allowed it to get old. We've allowed ourselves to kind of distance ourselves from the Lord, maybe not meaningful, not meaning to, I should say, but it can happen if we're not careful. In Psalm 34, in verse 11, Come, ye children, hearken unto me, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. We still need to learn how to reverence our Lord and still learn how to walk in a sense of awareness that, you know what, God is in control. God deserves for us to live uprightly before him and to follow him and love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. I believe one day, I know for a fact speaking for myself, that when I see him face to face, I'm going to have regrets of myself. I'm going to realize, you know what? I didn't do as much as I was supposed to. I didn't get as close to him as I should have. Because sometimes we think, we think we're doing pretty good. 
I'm telling you, I know for a fact, when I see him, when I get into his presence on that day, I'm going to realize I wasn't even close to where I thought I was. But you know what? I'm glad that right now he still gives me the opportunity to keep learning. Keep learning, okay, I need to press on. I need to get closer. I need to, okay, I didn't listen to him that time, but he's given me another opportunity. You know what? I'm going to take the opportunity to listen very intently and do what he asks me to do because I want to learn. I want him to keep speaking to me. I want to keep sitting in his presence. I want to keep following him. Look at Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Do you know who it was that heard Jesus the most during his ministry? Do you know who it was that heard his words and received his words gladly while he was walking upon the face of this earth? Those that were drawn to him. Those that had a desire. The Pharisees heard him, but they didn't have a desire. Therefore, his words meant nothing to him. But yet Mary would sit at his feet. Crowds would throng upon him. I mean, they would listen intently. In Psalm 119 and verse 27, God is the Lord which hath showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords even unto the horns of the altar. Is that what I want? <clears throat> nope. I apologize. I am in Psalm 118. So Psalm 119 in verse 27. You were in the right place. I wasn't. He says, make me to understand the way of thy precepts, so shall I talk of thy wondrous works. Again, learning from our master, learning from the Lord, we are reminded of his works. I mentioned you know, something in my life this morning where I wanted God, okay, what am I supposed to learn from it? What am I supposed to learn from what happened two months ago? Never stop wanting to learn. Again, everything happens for, nothing happens by chance. You already know that you weren't born by chance. No one's born by chance. There's a reason. God, God gives life. And he gives life so that that person, and specifically you and me, can learn more about him. Paul said he wanted to learn. He, he had not attained unto a perfect knowledge of God, but he wanted to learn more and to learn about the power of his resurrection. You know, yes, I know the Lord raised from the grave three days after they crucified him, and I know why he did, you know, doctrinally, but you know what? I want to know why he did for me. I want to know more. I don't want to just learn the precepts to, you know, have a good knowledge of the doctrines of the Bible, which is good, but I want to learn what does it mean for me? How does it benefit me? Every message that I hear, Lord, how does it benefit me? What can I learn? Everything, whatever happens at work, whatever happens outside of work, in my family, anything, what can I learn from this? How will this help me to get closer to you and further down the path that you have set before me? Look at Psalm 143 in verse number 10. And believe me, the Lord does not leave us guessing. When we truly seek him with all of our heart, we shall find him. If we truly want to know what it is that God wants us to learn, he will open our eyes and he will teach us. He will show us plainly. In Psalm 143 in verse 10, he says, teach me to do thy will. Do we want to learn to do God's will in the life that he's given us? Do we truly want to learn to do God's will? Or are we satisfied with just walking through life haphazardly? Do we truly want to learn? Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. Thy spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. Teach me to do thy will. Lord, what is it you want me to learn today? I mean, that's really, that should be a part of our prayer in the mornings. Lord, it's a new day. 
I can't change yesterday. I can't relive yesterday, even if it was a great day and it just everything played out just fine. But Lord, today's a new day. Help me to learn what I need to learn today. Help me to see. Help me to be spiritually aware of everything throughout this day and how you're leading me, what you want me to learn, and help me to see it and apply it to my life and to use it so I can continue drawing closer to you. In Psalm 138, it says, For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. God has magnified his word above his name because his word is truly the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. You and I cannot have a successful Christian life without the word of God. You and I cannot grow without the word of God. We cannot have any wisdom in this world without the word of God. And it is the one thing that is neglected the most it's the one thing the devil fights against the most because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God and we are encouraged. And someone, can, someone may ask, well, how, do I, how can I truly draw closer to God? I can't see him. I can't sit next to him. And you already know the answer. It's through his word, drawing nigh unto God through the precepts and the truth of his word. Look at Luke chapter 17 as we think about the fact that he is the one to whom we do owe thanks. We draw nigh unto him because of our gratitude, because of our gratefulness, gratefulness to him. Again, that's what Mary Magdalene did there with the alabaster box and using the tears from her eyes to wash the feet of Jesus and her own hair upon her head to dry his feet and breaking the alabaster box upon his head. She drew nigh unto him with gratitude for her life, not just being touched by Jesus, but the power of Christ changing her life and her truly coming to a place where she felt loved, she felt accepted, she felt like someone truly cared about her. No, you think about even the unnamed woman that came to Jesus at the well, the Samaritan woman. And Jesus tells her, go get your husband. And she says, I have no husband. And Jesus says, you've said right, you have no husband. You've had five and the one you're with now is not your husband. She was trying to find acceptance and love and relationships. And yet when she was in the presence of Christ, and finished the discussion with him. And Jesus was ministering to her and moving in her heart. Man, she left the water pot and she ran into town with her heart full, saying, is not this the one we've been waiting for? Is not this the Messiah? And after the man came and saw and listened to Christ, then they tell the woman, we believe not just, not just because of what you said, because we've heard with our own ears. Never stop hearing the voice of God and never stop being grateful for what he's done in your life. It doesn't matter what age you are. Even the young people in this room tonight can be thankful for what God has allowed in their life. They're in loving families. They're surrounded by people who love them, people that have a walk with God, people they can look to and see, you know, how to have a relationship with God, but them themselves can have that own personal relationship. In Luke 17 and verse 16, I want you, actually, I want you to back up verse 11. And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. Now, how many were cleansed? Ten. Ten were cleansed. Ten desired to be cleaned. 
10 desired for the leprosy to be healed, for them to be restored because the, those that had a leprosy, they were cast out. They couldn't be with their family anymore. They had their own little community outside the city. I mean, they were doomed. But yet when they saw Christ, they cried out, and Jesus simply said, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And all ten had faith to turn and to start walking back to town. But obviously when you read on, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, at the feet of Jesus, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. Never stop learning how to give thanks to God for what he does in our life. As a parent, you always you teach your kids to say thank you when they receive anything or anybody does anything for them because it's not a natural thing to say thank you or to be grateful. And we teach our kids that. And we want to continue learning how to be thankful to the Lord for everything he does. And when he does anything, we want to learn to be quick to give him praise for what he's done. We want to be like the one man here, and the Bible mentions he was a Samaritan, which lets you know the other nine were Jews. And we could, you know, we could, we could justify and say, well, they're doing exactly what Jesus said. They're going to show themselves in the priest. They all recognize, you know what, we've been clean, and we're just going to do what Jesus said. And we ought to obey what God tells us to do, but then we still need to show the gratefulness that we have in our heart to the one who has shown love and grace and power in our life. Look at James chapter 1. Not just for healing, not just for what God has done, but what about what God has given? James chapter 1. And you look at verse 17. Verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Every good thing that ever happens is because of God. It doesn't matter if we did it, we did the work, or we, we put in the effort. God's the one that allowed that good thing in our life. Every good gift comes from God, and we can be thankful and need to learn to be thankful. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And you look at verse 13. Being thankful for the gifts that God gives into our life, the gift of healing, the gift of wisdom. I mean, just so many gifts. Even just the, the ability that you have to do anything. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 13, he says, And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. Even to be thankful for the work and the benefit from our own from the work that we do because God's given us the ability to do that work. It's not because of our own wisdom, our own strength, but God's given us. Then I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. But what if God doesn't give me any good gifts? What if I don't see any good gifts? What if I don't have any abilities or to be able to do anything? What if God hasn't healed me? And the one gift I can think of is someone may be saying all of that is he gave them the gift of breath to be able to say all that. That's a gift from God, just to be able to breathe. Again, we serve a good God who does nothing wrong. You cannot tempt God with evil, neither tempteth he any man with evil. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 7, the Bible says, For I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, 
one after this man or another after that. I mean, you read the whole context, the whole chapter, Paul is saying, you know what, because of the ministry he's in, he's not married, he doesn't have kids because of the traveling he does and the places he has found himself in, in prison and all this. He's like, you know what, those that are going to be in this ministry, you know what, I desire, you know what, that they be like me. But again, not everybody is like that. Some have a desire to want to be married and to have kids. Some have a desire to do things differently. And yet, Paul says that we can rejoice in that. We can be grateful for what God has given us and how God has designed us and how God has uh, cultivated us and, and, and crafted us according to his will. In Paul, God... When God's going to use you for anything, he's the one that develops the gifts in you. He's the one that prepares you for the mission he's going to have you do. Again, before Paul became an apostle of Jesus Christ, he was learned, he was educated, sitting at the feet of Gamaliel. I mean, he was a Pharisee. He was a religious man. He was an educated man. He was a man that people looked up to. He was not preparing himself to go off onto the mission field, but all the things that he was doing, God was preparing him to be saved and to become a missionary, an apostle to the Gentiles. Everything that happens in our life, God uses it for our good. He will use it so that we can be a vessel of honor, a vessel in the hands of God that God can use us and we can be thankful that, you know what? There's not a single Christian that's not usable. Honestly, they, I'll tell you this. The only Christian that's not usable is the one that refuses to be used. The one that is, refuses. I don't want to be used. I don't want God to do anything in my life. Well, then we miss out on the blessings we miss out on the closeness. We miss out on the fellowship. We miss out on the greatness that God wants to do in our life. Because he says, call unto me, I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Look at Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. You know, there's just times in my life and I find it more and more now that I just need rest. And sometimes it seems like you can't get rest because you got to bodily, physically keep going. But I'm glad that we can find rest unto our souls and we draw nigh unto him to get that, to get the rest that he gives spiritually, emotionally, and physically. When you look at Luke chapter 8 and look at verse 35... Again, this is the account of the Lord going over to the Gadarenes. The man possessed with demons. You know what, let's even back up because verse 35 is the end of it. Look at verse 26. Now again, I know this is about someone who is physically... He is physically possessed with demons. He is physically mutilating himself. He is killing himself as it will tell us, cutting himself with stones. I mean, he is, he is in spiritual bondage, emotional bondage, physical bondage. He has no rest in any of those areas in his life. And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth to land... There met him out of the city a certain man which had devils long time and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house, excuse me, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. And this is not the man, this is the demon inside of him. 
For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for oft times it had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he brake the bands and was driven of the devil unto the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep. And there was there a herd of many swine feeding on the mountain. And they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them. And he suffered them. Then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine. The herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. They drowned. And when they that fed them saw what was done, they fled and went and told it in the city and in the country. In verse 35, then they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. These men were afraid at the peace that they saw in this other man because they knew who he was. They had already tried controlling him and chaining him and they saw the supernatural power that he had and would break the chains and the fetters. I mean, they saw that his life was just out of control and he had no control and no one could control him. They saw just the demonic powers in his life and when they come to see what they have heard, they're afraid at what they see. They're afraid at looking at this man whose life is now calm, peace. He's in his right mind because he has the peace and the rest that we find in Jesus Christ. He has spiritual rest and emotional rest and physical rest. And the townspeople are afraid, and you read on, they want Jesus to leave because they don't know how to handle it. But again, I love the Bible shows us the extremes in people's life to show us that you know what God does have all power God can truly help us to have that rest on the inside that we need even the rest of our minds sometimes our mind just goes on and on and on and it just seems like we can't get any sleep because our mind just won't shut down because of things that we're thinking things we're trying to figure out yet God wants us to have that rest. He wants us not to be cumbered about in our spirit. He wants us to find that rest in Jesus. And that's why we draw near to him because we know. You and I know where to go to get help. I don't have to tell you you need to go to Jesus. You know to go to Jesus. But we have to make that conscience decision and that effort. We have to make that step towards the Lord because the Bible tells us draw nigh unto the Lord and he will draw nigh unto you. Look at Matthew 11 and we'll close here. Matthew 11 and verse 28. These are not things that you don't already know. These are things that we are reminded of. The reason why we do draw near to God the reason why we do call out to God, the reason why we do seek God with all of our heart. Because we know that without Him, we can't do anything. Without Him, we are lost. Without Him, we have no comfort. Without Him, we have no good thing in our life. And Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Doctrinally, speaking about salvation. When you read verse 28, 29, and 30, he's speaking about salvation. But you know what? There are those that God's people that we're working. We're doing what God wants us to do. We find ourselves, I don't know if you've ever found yourself burnt out or on the verge of being burnt out, finding yourself at the end of your rope, having done all that you can, and you find yourself just hanging on for dear life and hoping, okay, I hope today is the day that everything turns around. But it's at those moments that God does want us to turn to Him and say, okay, Lord, you're my rest. 
I can't hope that this ends. I need to hope in you. I need to find my rest in you. It's a wonderful thing to be able to lay your head down on a pillow at night and have no worries. Doesn't mean there aren't any problems. Doesn't mean you don't have, you know, that you've just given up on life. But to be able to lay your head down at night and have no worries in your heart and your mind because you've given it all to the Lord. Because you drew nigh unto Him. You're trusting Him. You're obeying Him. You're letting Him work in your life and through your life. And that is why it says in James, draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. What a wonderful promise and a reminder that when we do draw nigh to God, He draws nigh to us. Father, we do thank you for your goodness tonight, and we thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have to draw nigh unto you. Father, help us to continue to learn. These are just a few things to remind us about the privilege that we have and to draw nigh unto you to remember these things. But, Father, help us to continue learning and continue desiring to want to learn and continue to desire to want you to show yourself great and mighty in our life and to walk with us and talk with us and, and teach us what we need to learn. Lord, I pray that you would continue to not only encourage our hearts, but to continue stoking the fires within our hearts that we never lose the desire to want to draw nigh unto you, that we always, it doesn't matter if something bad's happening, we know that God is good and God's good to his people. As the piano begins to play, I'll give you a few moments alone in prayer.